Hello and welcome to today's webinar entitled Learn How to Transform a Basement with Electric Floor Heating. My name is Scott. I am from Warmly Yours and joining me today is... Hi, I am Lynn. I am also with Warmly Yours. What a coincidence. Well, thank you so much, Lynn, for joining us. And if you're watching us today and you have a question and you are on Crowdcast, you can, uh, at the bottom of the page, you'll see a, a little thing there that says ask a question so just click on that and we'll be glad to answer your questions as we go and if you're watching us on Facebook you have somebody watching our Facebook feed for us too and they will forward on any questions that we see there too so feel free to ask away so Lynn what are we going to be doing today so like you said, we're going to be talking about uh, heating basements with floor heating and specifically we're going to be going over to um, example projects that we've done previously with our products, uh, one being with our Tempstone product and then one being with Environ. Fantastic. So let's talk about heating a basement. The, some, some places have basements and some places do not have basements. So I'm going to go out on a limb and say that the people today live in an area that does have quite a few basements like we do here in the Midwest. Um, and we do realize that there are places in the United States that do not have basements. So um, for you people, just kind of follow along. And if you run into a basement, you'll know exactly what to do if you if that comes up. So um, what, what do we need to think about here when we're heating a basement? For the people that don't have one, what kind of problems do we have here in the Midwest? Right. So one of the biggest issues that it kind of comes up when trying to make your basement uh, usable is just issues with cold and humidity. So obviously it's below ground, at least partially, um, and heat rises. So it's difficult to get heat down below, um, you know, below the first floor into a basement. Um, and then there's also usually some issues with humidity as well, either from, um, you know, issues with water leakage or seepage into the basement, or just kind of, again, being below ground like that can kind of make it a little bit of a more humid, cold, um, a little bit more of an unwelcoming environment or feeling. So when you're trying to make that space um, a lot more comfortable, some place that you can you know, maybe do a home office, a guest room, a recreation area. Um, you want to make sure that you're going to be comfortable while you're down there. Um, so adding some extra heat to the floor where it's going to, again, be able to rise kind of more naturally than trying to, you know, shove hot air um, down below the surface. It's going to give you a lot more usable square footage in your home. And it actually can help keep your first floor um, a little bit e e more easily heated as well. Well, the good thing about radiant heat, especially floor heating, is that it not only warms the air, but the warm air is kind of an afterthought to the fact that radiant floor heating actually heats people and heats objects in the space first. So your air, your air temperature in your basement may be 65, but you're nice and comfortable because the floor heating is actually heating you, and it's heating you from the ground up. Um, eventually, once the items space do get warm they start giving off heat and that heat is the heat that you'll feel going up to the ceiling but most of the heat is concentrated um actually heating the bodies and heating the objects in the room so here are some different ways to do that heating can you go over those for us yeah, absolutely. So um, I, I touched on a little bit briefly um, the difference between Tempstone or Environ, so there is a difference. Um, and the main difference is that uh, it's going to be determined by what kind of flooring you're putting down, and we're going to get into that in just a little bit here. Um, but so using electric floor heating with basements um, as opposed to hydronic heating, which is kind of the older um, radiant heating systems with the hot water and the pipes and boilers and things like that. Um, with electric, you're going to have a lot more flexibility. So you can add it to a um, existing build. You can put it in a new build. Um, you don't have any maintenance either. So you also are able to more or less once the system is down, just have it run um, with no issues. Again, no annual maintenance, no concerns about leaking or um, you know issues with pumps pipes boilers all things like that obviously when you start bringing water or oil into a space um, there's just a few more fail points and things that can go wrong whereas with the electric floor heating once it's down it's more or less good to go indefinitely 
Yeah, in the old days, um, way back in the days when radiant heat was really just hot water, if you didn't put the hot water pipes in your basement floor in your concrete slab at the beginning, you were kind of out of luck. You, there was no way to heat the basement other than trying to do it with hot air. And, you know, hot air goes halfway down the, the space and it goes right back up, just like we're going to show you in this next slide. So there's a lot of different ways to heat that basement. And the good thing about it is that you can use this as a zone, which means you don't have to heat the basement when no one's down there. What you can do is with floor heat, you can actually zone it and turn it on when people are there and turn it off when people aren't there. So you're not spending money heating a space that you may only use two or three times a year, like when you have company or something like that, if your spare bedrooms are there. So let's take a look at this slide and describe to us what's going on, the differences between these two uh, uh, heating of the spaces. Yeah, so obviously this is not most likely not a drawing of a basement as the ceilings are pretty high, but it is a really great example picture showing um, exactly, you know, what you can expect with floor heating versus forced air. So obviously I'd say the majority or all of us grew up with forced air heating in our homes um, and that's what we're used to. So we are all pretty familiar, I think, with the, you know, kind of warm and cold spots that can come from that. Obviously, the closer you are to a vent, um, the closer you are to the ceiling, generally speaking, it's going to be a little bit warmer um, than in other areas of the room. Whereas with electric floor heating, since it's usually throughout the entirety of the space or a lot of the space, not necessarily, um, you know, 100% of the square footage, but at least generally 80% of it, um, you're going to have warm temperatures from floor to ceiling. And it's actually going to usually be, um, you can keep it at a lower temperature with more comfort than you can with forced air. So you could actually have it set at, you know, 75 or something like that. And it's going to be nice and toasty and warm versus with forced air, obviously there's a lot more heat loss happening as it moves through the vents and things like that. So you can kind of see it's a little bit more of a consistent warmth um, and it does tend to, again, give you kind of that natural warmth feeling as it just rises up from the floor, heats you, heats the air, heats the objects in the room. Yeah, the last thing you want to be um, when you're a person that's sitting in a basement is the person next to the cold air return because you are going to get all the breeze and none of the warmth. So that's going to be completely eliminated when you heat your basement from the floor heat. So let's try to determine what kind of flooring types and what product is used with each. Can you explain that to us? Yeah, so when you're looking at which product you'll want to use, you're first going to want to determine what kind of floor you're putting down. And that can be um, a little bit more difficult than it initially sounds, mainly in that choosing between or deciding if you are using laminate or vinyl can often be a confusing um, endeavor since often those terms are used kind of interchangeably in the flooring community. Um, so you want to make sure that you are fully aware of specifically what kind of flooring type you're putting down. And you also want to talk to the flooring manufacturer about any um, specifications they have when using radiant heat under their products. So Tempzone does tend to be our most popular system. Uh, it does come in the flex rolls you can see on the screen here, where you can cut and turn them. We also have easy mats, which are just kind of pre-sized. And then we also have custom mats or loose cable. So there's a lot of different options, a lot of flexibility when it comes to the installation of a temp zone system. And again, these tend to be the most popular because they go under the majority of popular flooring types. So tile, stone, or marble, um, nailed hardwood, or LVT. So LVT, um, you know, luxury vinyl, either tiles or planks um, is going to be compatible, generally speaking, with temp zone. And then the other heating system we offer is Environ. So this does come in, again, those cut and turn flex rolls. And if you are in the States, it can be compatible with carpet. Um, and then it, either in the States or in Canada, you can put it underneath uh, laminate or floating floors, floating hardwood. So yeah, if you have a floating application, that's where you use the environ flex rolls because nothing attaches to the environ and the environ attaches to nothing. It's all free floating and you don't have to worry about tacking anything to the floor. Um, the thing is with that, um, it's every floating floor except for LVT or LV or LVP or whatever you're using because of the problems with LVT and being so flexible. 
that's why it needs to be done with um, with our um, Tempstone product. So that's the difference. Uh, if, if it ever becomes a question where you don't understand or you don't know which one to choose, just let us know what the subfloor is and let us know what your flooring type is and then we will figure out for you which would be your best fit. So that's why we're here and that's why we're, uh, we've are we got so much experience. You might as well lean on us and we'll be glad to guide you through that process. And also if you don't so, know specifically what type of flooring, I have a lot of people say, well, I, I'm getting a laminate vinyl. Well, is it a laminate or is it a vinyl? And we can, you know, if they give us the the link or information a little bit, you know, a lot more on the specifics, then we can always help figure out exactly which kind of flooring you're putting down and what the best uh, installation process will be. Exactly. If you tell us a laminate, then we're going to design a system for laminate, but laminate and LVT are not interchangeable. So very good point. Thanks for bringing that up. And so we do have, let's... Uh, sorry to interrupt one more thing. We do have on our website um, a previous webinar, I think you and I did together, Scott, um, specifically on LVT installation. So if you're interested in learning more about the specifics of that, we get into some of the minutia. So feel free to check that out on the website. Yeah, we also have an installation video of most mm -hmm. of these types of flooring too, which which is also going to help. So um, when you're in a basement, normally if you're making it a living space, it's not going to be a dirt floor and it usually isn't going to be wood laid out on mud or gravel, it's usually going to be a concrete slab. So the problems with concrete slab is they tend to pull the heat down from the heating wire, not letting it go upward. So what's so important about this insulating underlayment and why do we quote it whenever we have a product going over concrete? Right. So like you said, concrete really acts as a heat sink. So it tends to um, really want to absorb that heat first until it is about the same temperature as the ambient temperature in the space. And then it will let that heat kind of start rising um, once that slab is fully warmed. And obviously that can take a lot of time and energy and it is not especially efficient. So you want to make sure that you're putting an insulating barrier between the heat and the slab so that the heat can actually rise like it's intended to. And for that, we recommend Cerasorb. Um, it's our synthetic cork. It's fully synthetic. It doesn't promote any mold growth, any mildew, and it's really great for areas that are going to have high humidity or moisture, um, specifically like basements. Um, so this way you'll have a uh, thermal break between the slab and the heat. You're not going to have to worry about any kind of mold growing or things like that. You can just lay out your um, Cerasorb and then you'll put your heat over the top and then the flooring on that. And we're going to get into the process or kind of like the, the cross sections of all of that in a minute. Yeah, this, this product is really good at making the heat go upward, and that's what it's all about. It's, it's, it, in the old days, you used to, to try to heat a slab, and so what you were doing is you are heating four inches, six inches, eight inches of concrete with hot water. What we're trying to do is we're trying to heat the very thin layer on top, which means it's going to heat faster, it's going to respond better, and it's going to get warmer than trying to heat you know, six or four, six, eight inches of concrete. We're heating a very small amount, which means you can get faster results and warmer temperatures by using Cerasorb because we're making a very small area that's heated as opposed to a very thick area that's heated. So let's take a look at the basement tile with Tempstone cable. So when you're talking about tile, you are going to be attaching the Cerasorb to the subfloor. When you're talking about a floating application, the Cerasorb does not need to be attached to the subfloor. So very important that, uh, that you remember that. So let's go ahead and take a look at the basement tile with Tempstone cable. So describe to us what um, has gone into this particular job. Right, so this is a really great project overview. You can see uh, specifically the heating system used is a 240 volt Tempstone cable. Um, and then I think it's important to look at the uh, dimensions or the total uh, square footage versus the heated area. Um, we found on average about 80% of a room is going to be heated um, for various reasons. You want to um, avoid heating underneath uh, cabinets, bookshelves, uh, low lying, heavy furniture, things like that. Um, and usually you don't even want to go all the way up to the walls of the room. You'll usually have a foot or two of a non-heated perimeter just because it's not necessary to heat where you won't be walking. 
So this area, the total square footage of the basement was just about 1,300 square feet, and we ended up heating um, about 1,166 of those square feet. So the total wattage for that was um, 10,494 watts, uh, 43.9 amps, and it did require three 20 amp uh, non-GFI breakers. And that is one thing to keep in mind. Um, you want to make sure when you are wiring these or when you're looking at your electrical um, requirements or electrical availability um, that you are planning for in non-GFI circuits as the GFI protection is in the thermostat. Um, so just keep that in mind. Um, and then the operating cost for this, again, kind of based on some averages, about $1.05 a day to heat, um, or per hour rather, and then um, $8.40 roughly to heat it for about eight hours a day. Awesome. So let's go ahead and take a look this is usually the first step in finding out what you're going to need what kind of product is going to be involved and it all starts with a very simple sketch with dimensions on it so describe what we need to look for and what the customer needs to do when they're sending this uh, project sketch to us yeah, so you want to make sure that you're getting us the most accurate sketch that you can. It does not need to be pretty um, as long as the dimensions on there are accurate. Um, so the main thing is that we need dimensions for just about every part of the room. Um, the more dimensions you give us, the easier it's going to be for us to make you a smart plan and for your installation to go off without a hitch. Um, so send in the layout of the space, the dimensions of the space, um, as well as the location of the power or where specifically you'd like the thermostat to be located, um, where any doors in the space will be, as well as any permanent fixtures. And I kind of touched on that briefly. Um, we have a lot of information on that on our website if you aren't sure what a permanent fixture is um, specifically, but it tends to be anything that is plumbing, columns, floor vents, anything that's going to need to be heated around and not underneath. And then you also want to let us know um, specifically for basement heating, um, if it's going over a concrete subfloor, if there's any expansion joints in that concrete and where those are located um, so that we can heat again kind of around them and not across or over the expansion joint. Right. And what's very, very important for people um, that, that you know are doing this the first time and they don't realize how important it is. If you don't tell us where, if you don't tell us that you have four columns that are supporting your first floor that go to your basement floor, if you have air vents, if you have stuff like that, we can't heat that square footage that those are taking up. So if you get a really tight design where we're heating a lot of that space, each time you have a post, that takes away a certain amount of available floor space. Then another post, you subtract that square footage. Then another post, you subtract that square footage. Then you have six or seven vents and you Sub, and you sub, um, subtract those square footages, all of a sudden you're going to end up with too much heating product if you don't let us know that. Also, if you have a cabinet that sticks out into the middle of the room like this one does on this plan, we're not going to heat under that cabinet. But once again, if you plan on heating under it, then you say, hey, you know what, I can't do that. You are now taking away available space on, this, on the floor and you're now going to have too much cable. The reason why that's so, uh, so important is because you cannot cut the heating cable and you cannot shorten it. So it's better to have a little too little electric floor heating than it is to have a little too much. Because if you have too much, then you need to start all over again and get us the right dimensions and we'll get you the right size product because you cannot cut the mat. So very, very good points there. Good way to get started and let our engineers work on it and they will give you something that looks like this. Tell us what's going on in this picture because it looks a lot like the other picture and I can see where we've designed around that cabinet too. Right, so you can really see um, exactly where you're going to be laying the cable. Um, you're gonna see the spacing for it. And then you can also see, Scott, if you can kind of show on that um, drawing where there are some halfway marks um, on the cables themselves. And then also on the drawing, uh, there's going to be some, um, I think it's a, it's a red dot on the drawing and correct me if I'm wrong, Scott, it's a white dot on the red cable in person, correct? Correct, yes. So that's the halfway point. So for each cable that you run, you're 
you're able to ensure that, you know, halfway through running it, that you're using the correct spacing and laying it out properly to make sure that you're not going to end up with, like we had said, you know, too much or too little cable at the end. Um, so, and at the bottom of the smart plan, you're also going to get some important information um, on the electrical specs and things like that, that we kind of went over earlier. So a smart plan is definitely the best way to get started with planning out your system so that you have all the information you need right there in front of you. Right. And you give this to the electrician too. So make a copy, give it the electrician because the electrician is going to have to put power to these spots on the plan where you have thermostats and uh, power relays. Uh, we call them uh, power modules and thermostats. So you can see there are three of them here. You can see that there or two of them here and the electrician would need to put those in there and also what you would want to do is it, you will want to make sure um, that we get the right number of breakers and your electrical installation plan will show you the number of breakers you're going to need and it will tell you the size of those breakers that you're going to need to supply power to those so it's very very important that you give this to the electrician because then they can go okay i see we need power here 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 i see we need power here here and here and then I've got the number of breakers I need and the size I need. That's my shopping list. Now I can go out and get ready for it. So that's that's a fantastic. I love to show the difference between this one and then go to this one. And you can see how it matches up and what you start with and what you get back from it. So earlier we stated that you let us know what the subfloor is and you let us know what the flooring is because we'll design the part in the middle like a sandwich. So let's take a look at this and tell us about this sandwich. Right, so you can see the concrete slab on the bottom and then uh, that serosorb that we recommend. So uh, for a tile application, you're going to first lay out um, a very thin layer of thin set and then you will uh, secure the serosorb to that slab. Then um, once that is down, you'll lay out your cable again according to your smart plan. And then over the top of that, you will um, put some thin set and your tile floor as you normally would. And there are a few different ways to do that, um, specifically, uh, you know, one and two step processes and things like that. Um, and we have, again, a lot of information on the website. Um, we do have an uh, installation video of putting tile down over TempZone. So if you're interested in the specifics of that, just feel free to watch those or reach out. Yeah, reach out to us and we'll actually send you the installation manual ahead of time so you can get an idea of what's going to need to be involved so you can plan for it instead of just waiting until the day you receive it and go, here's my installation manual. So it's always a good idea to find that or ask for it in advance because then you're up on the situation because the installation manual is what you're going to be going by. Oh, uh, videos are great, but they're just overviews. They don't touch every single topic about installation. Otherwise, the videos would be three hours long and you, no one's going to watch a three hour long video. So that's why we have the videos that show the general overview, but the installation manual is what needs to be followed. So if you'd like one of those, just let us know. and We'll be glad to send you one. Some light, especially as we get into winter, I think it's some nice reading. Like you could sit by the fire, read the installation manual, have some tea. I think it sounds very fun. Well, I yeah, think it's fun for it's, us. We like it. <laughs> yeah, before it gets dark at three o'clock in the afternoon, right? <laughs> oh, don't say that. So, uh, uh, so looking <laughs> at the thin set, uh, Scott, can you tell us a little bit about um, the specifics when it comes to the types of thin set and you know trowels, rollers, things like that? As you've you know actually kind of done these installations before. Well, yeah, you want to make sure so if you're especially if you're doing tile work, there are different uh, um, uh, types of adhesives you can use to put the serosorb down on the floor. But we've been selling this product for for decades. And really, the best thing to use is modified thin set because you're going to be using modified thin set to set your tiles anyway. So instead of looking for three or four different kinds of adhesive and a different kind of thin set, just get modified thin set and you can use it to attach the serosorb to the floor and to set the tiles above it. So what you need to do is when you're doing this floor, actually that's my ugly watch there, um, right below the grinder that I'm uh, taking the edge off. What we had is we had a concrete slab that kind of went off kilter a little bit. So what you need to do is you need to shave that spot that's sticking up down so it's nice and flat so your serosorb will make good connection. So you want to clean the floor really well you want to grind down any spots that are um that are sticking up get rid of any nails or pieces of wood or anything like that uh, any grease clean that up make sure it's nice and clean 
And the cleaner you can keep your floor while you're working on it, the better, because you'll get better adhesion of all your products. So you, you put the thin set down on the subfloor, you push the serosorb down into it, you use a roller to, uh, to, to push it down, you pull back a little bit to check the adhesion of the serosorb to make sure it's sticking well and that you've used enough thin set. And then if you are, you just keep working your way across the room, making sure you stagger the joints like you would see in brickwork on a brick wall. So that's what you want to do when you're putting the serosorb done. And we have a video that shows exactly how to do that. And what we're moving on to now is something that everyone is going to need when they do an installation. There's no way around it. Fortunately, these two things are very inexpensive and they are going to be a very, very helpful and they're going to make your installation go very well. So what are we looking here? What are what what is everybody going to need to buy here? Yeah, so these are, um, this is an ohm meter and a circuit check. So the first thing on top, the, the picture is of an ohm meter. Um, and that's what you're going to want to use to check at every stage of the installation process to make sure that the heating system is functioning properly. A lot of people think, oh, well, there's no way to know if it's working. So I have to, you know, wire it and turn it on. And you want to make sure you are not ever doing that until it is down and installed fully. So that's where the ohm meter comes in. It's going to be taking a uh, test of the resistance um, in the cables themselves to make sure that you do have the proper readings and everything is working properly. Um, so we always recommend, um, we do test our mats or cables before they leave the warehouse um, from us. Obviously things can happen during shipping. So we always recommend uh, testing the system once you receive it. Um, even if you're not planning on doing the installation for you know maybe a few days, weeks, months, just making sure that it arrived safely and everything's looking good. And then we also recommend um, at every step of that installation process. So the beginning of the installation um, at every, um, you know, every time that you kind of finish a step, just checking it, making sure everything's working properly. It only takes a few seconds. And this way, you know that you're putting down a functioning system. We also offer circuit checks, which is that uh, little white device in the bottom uh, picture. It is an alarm that's going to be attached to the cables or the mats uh, to the actual wire itself during the installation. So if something is damaged, it's going to set off um, a loud alarm so that you know uh, something is wrong, something happened to the cable, you'll know roughly where that is to fix it, um, you know, exactly how to fix it. And then uh, you will be back to, you know, putting it down and finishing this properly with a working system. Okay, now that we've tested, because the last thing you do is put a, a hard flooring surface over a product that's been damaged. So that's why we go through all this. Every, every webinar we do, we make sure we talk about testing because it's very important. So we are now showing a slide where the Cerasorb has been attached to the subfloor. And what are we seeing here? Right, so you put down um, double-sided tape to attach those fixing strips to the serosorb or to the subfloor. Um, and you can actually see specifically um, the in the back, the cables, or not the cables, the fixing strips themselves. Those are just the little plastic uh, strips that you will adhere to that uh, serosorb. And then um, we'll hold the cable in place as you run it back and forth. So here we can see the cable installation. One thing I can share with the crowd before you do your bit here, Lynn, is that when you are putting the cable down, you need to pay attention how many of the little nubs are sticking up. You can see here on this picture, you can see that there's one, two, three, four. That's how you do your spacing. Your spacing will be noted on your installation plan. So you're either doing three inch spacing or four inch spacing usually. And what that is, is each one of these is one inch in a width. So if you have three of them, you're doing three inch spacing. If you have four of them, you're doing four inch spacing. So make sure you do the proper spacing as specified on the plan to make sure that you have a successful installation. You don't have too little cable or too much. That's where the white dots come in very handy on the cable. So you can compare how your white dot is on your cable compared to the red dot on the plan. And also when you're pulling the cable with the spool, notice how the spool is down by the floor. You want the strength of the, of the double-sided tape is in its sheer um, ability, the, the, the ability to keep it from shearing away. If you pull it up, you are 
going to possibly pull the um, the cable fixing strip up off the tape, but if you pull it to the side, those will stay very, very uh, well, and they stay attached very well there. So notice when you're doing the cable, don't hold it up by your up by your face and go back and forth. Keep it down by the floor and go back and forth, and that will allow you to pull it tighter and get the cable so they're not moving around so much. So go ahead and finish off this one and, and continue on. Yeah, so again, you're going to be following the smart plan layout, um, running it back and forth and kind of that serpentine pattern. Uh, something to keep in mind is at the end of the uh, cable, there is going to be an end cap. There's a factory splice between the cold leads and the heating cable themselves. Um, so you, those both need to be fully encased in thin set or self-leveling cement, uh, whichever one you're going to be putting down. Make sure that both of those are completely covered. And generally speaking, we find it works very well to cut into the Sarasorb just a bit to lay that factory splice and that end cap into the Sarasorb so that there's no, you know, bumps or ridges. It makes it just a nice flat surface. And then um, specifically if you're using or especially if you're using self-leveling, um, although it never hurts to uh, do this even with thin set, you'll want to secure a cable to the subfloor um, with tape every two to three feet, just making sure that it's not going to be moving around um, and especially with self-leveling it can float up in the self-leveling since that is so that cement is so dense so you want to make sure that you are securing it well so it's not going to be adjusting once you begin your next step of installation yeah the last thing you want to do is have all because this will float to the top and we get phone calls all the time from people to go oh i, I saw a lump in my self-leveling so I ground it down and I found out that there was a cable there. That's because the cable floated to the top. And if you don't secure it very, very well, you are going to get these little peaks of the cable sneaking up to the top of the pour. And the last thing you want to do is be dealing with that. So you have to adhere it to the subfloor very well. Thanks for bringing that up. So the next point here is let's talk about the floor sensor. Right, so um, in all of our thermostats or all of our thermostat boxes, um, there's going to be a floor sensor that comes with it. Uh, so one uh, kind of helpful tip that we have found is making sure that you are aware of that uh, sensor and the fact that you will need it before you put the floor down. Uh, it's not uncommon for people to hold onto the thermostat box, kind of toss it to the electrician at the end of the job and say, wire this up. Um, and by that point, the flooring is already down and the floor sensor is... Uh, if not impossible, definitely difficult to get down retroactively. So you want to make sure that you are taking that from the thermostat box, that you're testing it with your own meter, and then that you are inserting it um, at least six, maybe eight inches into an open loop. So you want it between two heating wires. You never want it crossing over or touching a heating wire. Um, and you never want that um, floor sensor cable to be run in the same conduit as the cold leaves from the heating. Um, um, and one kind of common misconception we see a lot of is uh, the idea that you need to have the floor sensor, um, you know, dead center in the room. That really is not the truth. As long as it's six to eight inches into the heated area, um, it's going to pick up uh, pretty accurately the temperature that the uh, floor heating cables are giving off and give you an accurate reading. The one thing you want to keep in mind with your floor sensors, if you're doing a big sunroom, is to put the sensor in a place where the sun doesn't hit. Because if the sun hits it and warms the floor, then the thermostat's going to say, hey, this floor is warm. So that spot in the sun is really warm, but the rest of your floor can be cold. So think about where you're putting the sensor. It only needs to be six or eight inches in, but you want to put it somewhere where it's in the shade and not going to be hit by the afternoon sun because that spot will be warm and the rest of your floor will be cold. So uh, just take that bit of advice because we've talked to plenty of people who did not do that and all of a sudden the rest of their floor is cold. So let's go on to the next step and that is covering the cable with thin set or self leveling. So that looks like what's what has been done here. Yes, and this is again uh, the the time where you will want to be securing this to the subfloor very or the underlayment uh, very very well, and then you will want to follow the instructions on the packaging for your uh, thin set or self leveling. Um, if it requires a primer, be sure to install the primer before laying out the cables. Uh, you want to make sure that you are following those directions um, as each uh, type, each brand uh, can kind of vary. So you want to make sure that 
you're doing, uh, what's specifically best practice for the uh, type of uh, thin set or self-leveling that you're using. And the final thickness um, should be at least three eighths, maybe half an inch um, of, again, thin set or self-leveling concrete. Any more than that is generally going to start kind of uh, reducing the heat that you'll be feeling coming up through the floor. And any less is not going to be fully embedding the heat. So you want to make sure that you're looking at about three eighths of an inch to a half inch. Very, very important that you follow those instructions. And also, one of the worst things that you can do to, you, to the integrity of your floor is to turn on the heat before the floor has cured. So people always want, oh, man, I just put this in. I want to feel how warm it is. The worst thing you can do is heat up um, thin set that hasn't cured yet. And you say, well, how long does it take for us for this thin set to cure? That's on the side of the bag. So the bag will say, we'll cure in seven days. Days. We'll cure in 14 days. We'll cure in 28 days. That's the amount of time it takes for the, the excess liquid to come out and to leave a nice solid piece of thin set that's interlocked correctly and done the correct job. If you turn on your heat too soon, you can cause that thin set to not set up correctly and also make it very brittle, which could lead you to some problems with your floor. So the last thing you, you wanna do is turn on your floor do it after the product has cured. So that is going to be your key and that's on the side of the bag. So let's talk about installing tile. Right, so you'll want to put the tile on that final layer of thin set once that has cured, like you said. Um, Scott, this looks like it might be you actually laying out the tile, is that correct? Yeah, and what you can do is, I think there's a small typo here that we didn't catch uh, yesterday. You don't have to wait for that first layer to cure to put the tile oh, on you. you just yes. need to you just need it to be solid enough to hold you which is next usually the next day so you just cover it up the first day with thin set come back the next day and then you can start tiling over the top so sorry about that little typo we missed it we went through this yesterday and i didn't notice it i didn't but, either. Uh, <laughs> but it's one of those things so just make sure that when you're putting this tile down there's a couple things to think about make sure that you're putting the correct amount of thin set down on the existing thin set fresh so you can put your tile down but before you put your tile down take the tile and back butter it and make sure that you get 100 percent adhesion to the back of that tile you would be surprised at the number of pictures of people that people send us where all of a sudden you know three months later they knock on the tile and it sounds hollow that hollow sound is not being caused by the floor heat that hollow sound is being caused by the fact that they they didn't butter the tile. They didn't get good adhesion between the tile and the existing thin set. So what it's done is it's got great big voids underneath, and that's where the hollow sound comes from. So to make sure that you don't get any of that, any of that hollow sound, you need to make sure that you back butter it and comb it correctly with the correct thin set. If it's a large format tile, you need to buy large format thin set because that's a requirement. And you need to get the correct size of trowel that's dependent on the type of of a uh, tile that you're putting down or natural stone. It'll tell you what to use. Your thin set will say, use this type. And, and that's what you want to do. Also, when you're laying the tile out on the floor and you're, th you're setting the thin set, you're, you're adhering it to the floor, you want to make sure that you clean the grout lines as you go, because you don't want somebody to come by in a week or two with a really sharp blade and start cutting and using that blade to clean out the grout lines. You do not want that because if you go too deep, if you look on this picture, you can see the wires are right under there. So you don't want somebody going, you know, I'm going to clean this with a really, really sharp blade. And all of a sudden they go boom and they hit the wire. Um, and and we see that really, a lot. It's a really bad situation. So clean the grout lines with a rag or with a sponge or a toothbrush works really, really well. Once you lay the tile and you put the next tile next to it, just go ahead and use a toothbrush, get that excess out because now you've just saved money on having somebody come in and, and clean the grout lines and you don't have to worry about them either. So that's what you want to do. And this is the case where you want to make sure that you wait until the product has cured before you turn it on. So those are some important things to worry about. So that's the mechanical part of putting the product in. Talk about the electrical part. 
Right. And this can vary quite a bit depending on your local codes and municipalities. So uh, take everything we say, I don't want to say with a grain of salt, but be sure that you are um, talking to your local code authority and talking to any electricians or whoever will be um, on the job site doing the work. Um, so you want to make sure that you are following all local electrical and local building codes. Um, many will require that this uh, wiring be done by a licensed electrician. And uh, personally, I think it's not for a bad idea if you are not a licensed electrician to have somebody come in and do the wiring it tends to be pretty quick pretty simple for them to do it isn't especially you know time consuming or expensive and then you know that it's been done right and safely yeah there are a few states in the union that actually require a electrician to lay the product out on the floor and you need to make sure that if you're in one of those states that you have an electrician lay the product out on the floor, not the tile installer. So it's very important to realize that ahead of time because you don't want to get caught in, a, a, um, in an inspection. And then they go, oh, you did that wrong. We're not going to sign off on this. We try to prevent, pre present as much information information ahead of time so you don't have problems with the inspector as it comes along. So always make sure that it's installed per code and, you know, make sure that if it requires conduit that you use conduit to get the non-heating lead up the wall to the thermostat. Some places require conduit, some places don't. You can just run the lead right up the wall if you want to. So that is up to to your load and that's the way you want to do that. So make sure that you don't have any problems with your inspector. So let's go ahead and talk about the pretty part, the only part that you're ever going to see of this installation, and that is the thermostat. Yes. So again, making sure that this is uh, wired up according to local code um, done by an electrician. And then um, there are lots of different settings. Well, first, I should say there are lots of different types of thermostats that we have. Um, we have things that are uh, or things, thermostats that are non-programmable, um, that are kind of just set it and forget it. We have some that are uh, programmable, you know, seven day programming. We have some that you can control from an app on your phone. So there are lots of options depending kind of on your lifestyle and how you're planning on using the system um, that you can kind of play around with. Um, and then actually our Inspire Touch, which is the one shown here, um, does actually come in white, black, or radiant crystal. So like you said, Scott, if you want to make it extra pretty, we can definitely help you out with that. And then in these thermostats, there are um, a few different floor protection settings that you can set to make sure that any um, temperature limitations are being taken into consideration. Um, if there is a, was, which this is why specifically um, we all always recommend talking to the floor manufacturer, seeing if they do have any limitations or restrictions on uh, the highest temperature that can be used with their flooring. Um, tile tends to be able to be heated to the highest temperature um, and then things like laminate or vinyl are usually going to have much lower uh, maximum temperatures and you can set those on your thermostat to to ensure that you're not damaging the floor. So the installation that we've just talked about here has been done with tile and tile 99 times out of 100 has no temperature limit. You can get tile as hot as you want to. And the thing to remember is, especially we talked about um, uh, sunrooms before, that the sun is going to impart more heat into the floor than our heating system ever will. You're going to, if, you're, if your drapes are open and your and sun is hitting that floor, it could go up into the hundreds of degrees. You know, it could go over 100 degrees of temperature. Our product will never, ever get that hot. So when people say, well, I'm kind of worried about electric floor heat, the electric floor heat is going to add less heat to this, to this uh, spot than the sun does. So that's why it's so safe and a lot of people use it. So let's take a look at the final, final. The final. It looks awesome. And that's done with a tile uh, that's a like a, t uh, a plank tile that um, simulates the look of wood. It's a beautiful um, um, installation there. And if you look down at the uh, um, fireplace, that room that we had pictures of was just to the left of there. That's where we were taking some photos and showing the self-leveling over the top there. So that's uh, in this exact space. And it turned out really, really well. So let's talk about some of the details. Yeah, absolutely. So for the entirety of this project, the MSRP was $10,700. Uh, they used 
five cables. Um, there was one Wi-Fi thermostat used and then three power modules um, acting as a relay so that everything can be controlled through just the one thermostat. Um, they used five circuit checks. Again, um, one circuit check per cable or per uh, mat that you're putting down. So, and again, those are pretty cheap. They come to about uh, $15 each roughly. So, it does not hurt to have one for each cable, making sure that you are uh, doing that correctly and not going to end up with a damaged system somewhere along the line. Uh, and then, of course, the fixing strips and that Sarazorb for that grand total of 10700 So the question we get all the time is, what's better, 120 or 240 And the answer to that is they're both the same. 240 is not more efficient than 120. That's an old wives' tale. It is simply allows you to cover twice the space as a 120 circuit. Our thermostats are 15 amps. They can they can switch up to 15 amps in 120 or 240. But the thing is, 120 circuit will allow you to heat about 120 square feet. It's really easy to remember. And then a 240 circuit will allow you to heat about 240 square feet. So instead of making it 120 and buying two controls, you can make it one control and heat up to 240 square feet. So that's why we automatically for small bathrooms and you know up to 54 up to 120 square feet, we will design that in 120 volt. For larger spaces that are over 120 volt, we'll automatically start doing it in 240 because it can cut the number of controls in half. So that's why we choose 240, not because it's more efficient because it allows you to cover twice the space per control. So very, very important that we, that we dispel that myth that 240 is more is, is, is better. And what, we'll, what we also see out in the field is electricians automatically, they say floor heat, okay, I need a 240 volt circuit. You don't automatically need a 240 volt circuit. And we see people who hook their 120 volt product up to a 240 volt feed and that 240 volt feed damages the 120 product. So never ever assume that since it's floor heat i need 240 circuit we will let you know what you need and for, for smaller jobs all you need is 120. very very important to remember that because we want your installation to go as smoothly as possible so now we have talked up to this point about an, a tile installation but what we're going to be doing now is carpet and one thing to keep in mind with carpet most carpet has a maximum temperature that you can set the thermostat to so you need to keep that in mind and when you're looking for carpet, you want to find a carpet that has an R value of one or less. And you want to make sure that you find out from the carpet manufacturer what the maximum temperature is so you can set your thermostat for that. So a couple of different things you need to think about when you're actually doing an installation for carpet. And once again, carpet is uh, only in the United States. So let's go ahead and take a look at this project. So give us the overview of what happened here. Right. So again, this is a 240 volt system. Um, the total room area was 264 square feet and we heated about 207 of those square feet with the Environ uh, flex roll. Uh, the total wattage is just about 2,400 watts, 10 amps. And again, that is requiring uh, one 15 amp and again, a 240 volt non GFI circuit. Um, and for this specific room, you're looking at about 11 cents an hour to heat. So if you were running it for eight hours a day, you'd be looking at about 88 cents a day. So the heated area is a very important thing to look at here because it's 207 square feet. It's under 240, which means we would automatically do this in 240 volt, and it allows us to use one thermostat. If we said, hey, let's do this in 120, then you'd be going, okay, well, now you need two controls instead of one. So that's the benefit here. 207 square feet is perfect for a single control to switch that amount of power needed for that space. So let's take a look at this smart plan. Yeah, and you can actually see specifically how you will be laying out these rolls. So um, again, where that arrow is, is the start and the black square is the end. And then it's going to show you actually how you'll be cutting and turning those um, to get them to fit into the space. 
and you can kind of see there's a pop out drawing on the right side showing specifically how you'll be cutting it. Uh, make sure that you are only cutting the foil or the mesh if you were using an environment or if you were using a temp zone system. Um, with the environment, it's more of a like almost a foil feeling uh, material and you can cut that. Just be sure not to cut the cable itself. We've said it before. I'm sure we'll say it again. Uh, you do not ever want to cut the cable at all. So make sure that you are only cutting the parts that you need to cut. Um, and then you'll be again run, running them back and forth kind of in that serpentine pattern to fit into the space according to that layout. Right. So you have to have that perimeter around the wall to make sure that the carpet stretcher can get their stretching machine there and grab a hold of the carpet without hitting the environ product under it. That's what that one foot is around the perimeter. Grab it, push it with the with the shrinker with the uh, installer, and then hook it onto the tack strip. Um, a couple things here at the bottom. Um, if we take a look here at the T, that's where the thermostat is, and these areas with the triangles, that's the beginning of the mat. Notice how the beginnings of these rolls are right by the T for thermostat. That's why you need to tell us where the thermostat is so we can start our drawing in the correct place. If your thermostat was up in this corner, we would have to redo this drawing because the cold leads, which are the non-heating leads, are only 15 feet long. And they will not run all the way over here and then all the way up to the new thermostat location. You can see the room size hasn't changed that the thermostat location has, which means we're going to take the same product, but we're going to move it all around our, our engineers are to make it so the triangles, which means the beginning of the mat, is going to be within striking distance of that T for thermostat. And then one last thing on here, if you see the word closet, notice that we do not heat normally in closets. Heating in closets is not allowed by the the national code, we get that request a lot. And if you would like to heat your closet, then that's something that you'd want to talk to your local code authority, which is also known as the, in, in jargon, it's known as the authority having jurisdiction. So if you like that jargon, you can use that and impress everybody and say, hey, let me check with my authority having jurisdiction or AHJ to see if I can heat my closet. And if I can, if they say it's okay, then let's put heat in the closet too. But the National Electric Code does not allow that. Local code always supersedes that. So check with your local AHJ to do that. Take a look at the cross sections here. Right, so you can actually see since we're doing carpet um, and we're going to be using a carpet pad, um, we are forgoing that uh, that Sarah's orb for the carpet pad itself. So you would just lay that out directly onto the slab, lay out your environ, and then the carpet over the top. And you will be putting the environment in between the pad and the carpet. Um, that is a question we get a lot. Um, it definitely, um, I think it scares a few people because it does feel like then your environment is very close to the surface of the flooring, but that's what you want to do to make sure that the there is enough of a thermal break between the slab and the heat and that everything will heat up and uh, come to temperature properly. Yeah, and the old days when you were doing when you were heating the slab you would want to have a low r value carpet pad and a low r value carpet that would allow the heat to come up from the slab and go into the heating area into the floor itself well with this product you want a carpet pad that has a really good r value something in the two two and a half r value range because that's going to force the heat to go up uh through the carpet to feet so that's why it's very very important that's the one thing that's different with electric heat, because we're remember we're trying to minimize the amount of, of heating that we're doing, as opposed to heating you know six or eight ten inches thick. We want to heat that top surface, and that to do that we need a good R value in that carpet pad, but a low R value carpet to let the heat go upward where you want it. And this is what the room looks like. Looks pretty good, and I think it's. It's going to be great for Halloween, too. It looks kind of orange there, but that's good. Beautiful room. Charlie Chaplin approves. Um, hopefully no one from his estate is watching. That was just a joke. So, um, <laughs> but that's what you have. That's, that's what your carpet install will look like, and you'll have a nice warm space in this basement. So what we saw in the first picture was the larger part of the basement where the tile floor was, and then this is the home theater area, which is carpeted, and both of them are heated in the floor, which makes this a fantastic uh, way to do both types of surfaces, carpet and tile. So talk about this project and what it costs. 
Yeah, so again, there were two roles used, a thermostat with a Wi-Fi capabilities, and then uh, two circuit checks. So for this project, the total came out to MSRP, um, $2,393. Very good. And there's that uh, programmable Wi-Fi thermostat that you can control with an app on your phone. Also, you can set it to the maximum temperature so it will never exceed the maximum temperature allowed by the carpet company so very very good there and um what are some good tips for installing carpeting in the united states yeah so like you had mentioned earlier um just kind of driving that point home you do want to leave at least a foot of unheated perimeter for that carpet stretching um uh, machine to come in and do its work without damaging the flooring. Um, and then again, you also want to be sure that you're using a high R value carpet pad and a low R value carpet to allow for that heat to uh, rise as you will want it to do. Um, and then um, you also want to make sure that you are not going to be placing the mats under carpet seams. So if there's a seam in the carpet, try to avoid having the heating underneath that. And you'll also want to avoid any carpet with a pre-attached padding. Again, you want to make sure that this is going in between the pad and the carpet so it does need to be um, not attached to one another initially. Carpet squares are not your friend when it comes yes. to this type of Oh, you do not want carpet squares. So you want to avoid those because they're a piece of carpet with a pad attached to it already that you stick to the floor. And that does not work because environ you'd stick nothing to environ and environ sticks to nothing so that is a, a couple of really good hints when it comes to involve uh, in, in, involve when you get involved into a carpet installation in a basement and once again these spaces feel so much better than uh, my basement at my house has the vents overhead so the air comes about halfway down and then it goes right back up into the upstairs this way your feet are nice and warm, it heats the room evenly, and you're going to have a really nice space here to enjoy when you're doing your, um, your installation. So some great information there about how to get the correct quote. Um, do we have any questions here? I think we have a couple. Um, Lynn, do you have the questions there? Um, I that you can, can get them up? pulled up. Give me one second here. That'll give the folks oh. some time to type in there. Errors are also, if you're watching on Facebook Live, you can type your questions in there too. So um, what did you find? Yeah, so we got a couple questions um, from customers ahead of time. Uh, one is um, Edward was looking for options for insulating underneath heating cables. And we touched on that. Um, obviously, the Sarasorb is what we would recommend. Um, unless you're doing a carpet installation, then we would recommend a high R value carpet pad. Perfect. Great question. And then Carlene asked um, about information on installing glue down vinyl flooring. Um, so that is generally going to be um, a temp zone system with self-leveling concrete. And then you would glue down that floor over the self-leveling. Um, and obviously, again, you want to make sure that you are talking to that floor manufacturer about any um, limitations or any, um, you know, any considerations when working with heating and their product. Yeah, and we just did a webinar about heating LVT just a little while ago. So in our on our website, there is a whole section of our webinars that, where this one's going to end up residing. And we have um, that specific topic in one of our webinars. And we also have a video that shows how to install LVT um, in a room. So I don't see any more questions. Do you at this point? Right. Nope, I think we are all good. All right, so make sure you join us for our next webinar. Our next webinar is going to be in October, and October is usually the first month that the people in the Midwest and the North get their first frost. And when that hits, we get lots and lots of phone calls asking, how do I program my thermostat? When do I turn it on? Um, does it light up? Stuff like that. And I don't know if my thermostat's working correctly or not. That all happens on October 15th. So my bit of advice for the watchers now, for our viewers, is to check that stuff now before we get absolutely inundated with calls because we go from uh, a summer of calm to the autumn of, of phone calls Mayhem. going crazy. <laughs> It's better to, to get to check that out now and give us a call if you're having a problem to make sure it works for that first night. 
there's no maintenance to do on our products. It's simply turn it on and see if it works. If it works, you're good because you don't have to worry about pumps. You don't have to worry about, hey, is my boiler empty? You don't have to worry about my boiler doesn't fire up or whatever. It's just simply turn the system on, make sure it works. And we will also go through um, some troubleshooting tips for that. So make sure you join us Thursday at 1 p.m. Central Time on October 13th, two days before October 15th, and that's the magic day here. So join us then where we'll be talking about some simple troubleshooting tricks, and those simple troubleshooting tricks almost exclusively have to do with using your digital ohm meter. That's why we talked about it earlier, and we used a picture of it because you can see what it looks like. So talk to us about the daily trainings. Right. So right here on Crowdcast, we do offer um, at least once a day, often twice a day, um, a few daily trainings. Um, these are on various topics regarding snow melting or floor heating. Um, and they're usually pretty short, five to 10 minutes. Uh, so feel free to pop on in. And then if you have any questions, um, you know, either on that day's topic or just kind of in general, I'd be, oh, I'd be, I do tend to run a lot of these. Scott, I know you run a few of them as well. Um, we all kind of pass it off back and forth. Um, so somebody uh, will be here to answer any questions and go over um, some daily training topics for you. All right. And make sure you join us um, uh, with our monthly pr uh, promotion. And th that is where you can talk to anyone of us here at Warmly Yours because we're running a great promotion this month, the month of September. You can save 25% on select towel warmers. Just visit warmlyyours.com uh, or you can give us a call whenever you want to. So check out which ones are available at those reduced prices. There is nothing better than stepping onto a warm bathroom floor and grabbing your warm towel and uh, toweling off after a, a shower in the very, very cold winter. Yes. Oh. We do value your feedback. You're going to receive email shortly asking about your experience during this webinar. And we would appreciate it if you would let us know what you thought. And also, if we are not talking about something you're interested in, let us know what you're interested in because we'd much rather talk about something that you're curious about. So let us know. Maybe you've got a great topic that we can cover in a, one of our upcoming webinars that we do every month here at Warmly Yours. So how can they get a hold of us, Lynn? Right. So you can reach out however is easiest. Um, obviously, you can always give us a call. You can email either just our general informational email, or you can reach out to Julia Billen. She's our owner and president, uh, and she would be more than happy to chat with you, get all your questions answered. Um, so feel free to email her directly if you would like. And of course, um, we are on social media, on Facebook, um, on, I believe, Instagram, Pinterest. And then, of course, our website, uh, which we have mentioned a handful of times already, is a treasure trove of information. Um, almost anything you could ever want to know about any of our products is going to be on that website. So feel free to uh, play around on there, learn some more about our products, and reach out if we can be of any assistance. That's awesome. Now, I'm a MySpace user. That's my only bit of social media. So um, I'm going to have right. to take your to take your word on the, the Facebook and other stuff like that. But um, So check me out at, at, at MySpace whenever you'd like to. But until you... Make sure that you uh, join us again next time. We're going to be here next month talking about how to troubleshoot your system. So until next time, stay warm. And be radiant. Thanks for watching, everybody. Take care. Thank you.